Firstly, as a sort of poll, how many people here have listened to or are interested in the ideas of positive psychology, happiness, and this type of stuff? You, from a non-Muslim perspective, you looked up like Tony Robbins, Zig Zagler, you know, those type of people. Okay, good, very good. Um, so, positive psychology is, is a fad at the moment. A lot of people are talking about it. Even in very industri well, post-industrialized industrialized nations, where there's a lot of wealth, you'd expect people to just be happy, but that's not what seems to be the case. It seems that there is actually um, a lot of problem with depression, with um, suicides, with all sorts of social ills within very wealthy nations, like Scandinavian nations, like Norway and whatnot. So the topic of psychology and positive psychology in the pursuit of happiness is a very live one. However, there's an interesting debate that's been going on recently within the field of evolutionary psychology in regards to happiness. Now happiness, the way it's been sold by Western gurus like Tony Robbins and others, is basically like, okay, we need to be happy. To be happy, you've got to do this. To be happy, you've got to work hard. To be happy, you've got to have a vision. You've got to have this. You've got to have that. And some people, you know, they've tried out some of these things and they do work, like generally being grateful. This is one thing that they talk about, which is also in Islam. And also generally um, understanding that one of the reasons for your unhappiness may be that you have a blueprint of what you want to achieve in life and you have the reality, right? So you have this ideal where you want to be, right? When I'm 25, when I leave university, sorry, when I'm 35, I would have left, left university uh, by 35. I should have been married, should have had a few kids, should be doing quite well. And most people, when they, when they get to that age, they start to realize, hang on, this isn't what I thought. This is a lot more difficult. You know, my mother-in-law is being horrible. <laughs> so it's, it's, life hits you. Life hits you, right? So... This topic is also related to, as you can probably tell by the way I'm priming the conversation right now, it's related to the problem of evil and suffering. Because that is a big issue. You have people who they never thought, right, my partner's going to pass away at the age of 31 and I'm going to be a 28 year old widow, which, is, which, which happens, I'm, I'm sure some of us know in our families someone discovers that they have some sort of genetic disorder or cancer or whatever. So these things come and they come within every family. So that is like, if, if you like, you're like going towards this, this road of happiness and then you just get a dharna, <laughs> you just get a blockade, yeah? So how do you deal with that? Now, the, what I want to do first is I want to first speak about the concept of happiness as a evolutionary mechanism and why that although it's tempting and in fact there's a whole uh, positive evolutionary psychology field now how even that is bound to eventually fail and even if someone uh, works on it they work on it for a little while they'll um, they'll get some benefit but eventually they'll have some problems so basically evolutionary psychology it's the explanation of human behavior in terms of natural selection. So why do I act in a particular way? Because in the ancestral environment, you had a particular um, mutation which allowed you to act in a particular way which enhanced your fitness. So your behavior is a product of your evolution. So the idea is that human emotions happiness, sadness, fear, anxiety, hope. These are not actual ends. These are proximate mechanisms to get you to an end. As an example, uh, there is an evolutionary psychologist, not evolutionary thinker rather, um, although he does speak about evolutionary psychology, he gives the example of a professor um, who was very 
anxious and had problems with anxiety and was feeling quite down. So he asked Randolph, Randolph Nessie, which is the name of this thinker, you know, I'm feeling down. What do I do? I'm feeling like really, really down, you know, um, uh, my life's difficult and whatnot. So he just recommended for him, you know, just take this, this medication, antidepressants and whatnot. So um, a few weeks later, Nessie asked him, you know, how are you doing? How are you feeling and stuff? You know, you're feeling down. And, and then uh, the professor said, yeah, I'm feeling great. I'm feeling fantastic, actually. But I've just got a heap of student papers. I haven't marked them yet. So what basically happened, Nessie realized, is that he was anxious about marking papers of students as a professor. And that anxiety was basically getting him to work. And once he took that pill, it got rid of the anxiety and it got rid of the mechanism that helped him do that work. So Nessie started thinking that, hang on a second, this is a good example to explain that happiness is not the goal. The goal is survival and reproduction. And sometimes natural selection will give us happiness, anxiety, fear, something else to achieve that end. So from that perspective, the ultimate goal is survival and reproduction. Everything else is instrumental to that end. So if that's the case, then there's a big problem in terms of our human behavior because we are geared towards happiness. We long for happiness. We desire happiness. In fact, for the sake of happiness, human beings will sever the most fundamental human needs. In fact, you will find people who will leave everything, every material thing they have, and go off in Tibet in a cave somewhere at a monastery and try and become enlightened. So they're giving up from an evolutionary perspective the core things, survival and reproduction, and they're trying to actually get some form of happiness. So happiness clearly from an evolutionary perspective is different to the way that humans act. Because from an evolutionary perspective, it should be just something which is instrumental. However, as human beings, we treat happiness as an end in of itself. Okay, so the first point which I want to make is that happiness for us as Muslims, it's an end. It's not a means to an end. Okay, so if that's the case, then obviously, by default, if you're Muslim, the other view is wrong. The other view that everything else is instrumental is wrong. Okay, usually when I give talks, uh, my audiences are non-Muslim. So it's going to be interesting today because I'm going to try and um, use the same sort of arguments, but obviously you're coming from a different paradigm to them. Alhamdulillah. So... <laughs> So you may have different questions. So the usual way I try and explain to non-Muslims when it comes to the pursuit of happiness is I try and start off with a simple idea, a thought experiment rather. I say, look, if you were given right now your bucket list, everyone familiar with what a bucket list is, yeah? You know those things you want to do. I want to be rich. I want to go to Egypt, I want to, you know, skydive, all that. So if you were given your bucket list with 20 things, right, and those things were fulfilled, you were given them, would you be happy exactly a year after all of that is done? And there's an interesting way that I've worded that, and there's a reason for that. And the answer I usually get after a bit of back and forth is actually no, coming to think about it. Because when we start imagining something, it's, it's as if we are there, right? I'm sure you guys are aware of neuro-linguistic programming. So when you start thinking of, don't think of the purple elephant, don't think of the purple elephant, don't think of the purple elephant, it's there. You will, every thought is an emotion. Right? So when you start thinking about something, it's as if you are nearly there. So when you actually imagine yourself, right, I've done my bucket list. 
Now what do I do? Right? And you start to realize, no, that wasn't, that wasn't something that made us uh, fulfilled. Anyone here, uh, I'm maybe a bit dated here. Anyone here familiar with Jim Carrey? Yes. Comedian, thank God. I'm not a dinosaur. Okay, one, two, how many? Three, four, we're great. Millennials, great. Okay, so which of his films do you guys remember? Uh, Ace Ventura. Ace Ventura, what else? Yes Man, Truman Show, yeah that was good, The Mask, Liar Liar, perfect, Liar Liar, Dumb and, Dumber. and Dumb and Dumber, in fact if you see his life is very interesting because the first time we see him in a big film, he's like in his late teens I think, in Dumb and Dumber, something like this, or early 20s, and then you see him throughout and now he's actually old. He's got like a long white beard. He's old. And he's moved away from Hollywood. He's moved away from the red carpet. He's moved away from interviews. He's moved away from acting. He's moved away from all of that nonsense, according to him. And what he's basically saying is, I wish everybody has what I have so that they know this is not the answer. What he's basically referring to is that he got everything he wanted. He wanted to be famous, he got that. He wanted to travel the world, he got that. He wanted to be a celebrity, he got that. Everything that he wanted, he had, he has. And he's basically now come to near the end of his life and realized this is all meaningless. This all basically didn't have any meaning. And that is powerful because that is the feeling of emptiness that Allah in the Quran tells us you will get if you turn away from his remembrance. And what we need to realize is that the pursuit of happiness, if it's paved with material things, those material things, they'll disappear. They, they'll lose value. I recently got this phone because, long story short, I just had to get a new phone. When I was young, in, when I was in my mid-teens, we didn't have phones like this, right? You know how we'd, we'd meet up with friends? You'd basically ring someone's house, tell them, look, meet me in this place, and then you'd go there and meet them, right? Or you'd go to a phone box. We didn't have this. If I was given this when I was 15 and no one else had it, I would be like the happiest person in the universe. However, look at human beings. We go from one technology to another technology to another technology and we're never happy. Even my, uh, my cousin as an example, she teaches and she spent a lot of her uh, income from her uh, tuition and stuff to buy a new iPhone. And the thing is, when you buy an iPhone like that, the first day it's like, oh my god, this is amazing. Second day, okay, great. A week later, hmm. Two weeks later, it's just like any old brick. It has no meaning. And that's a good analogy for everything in life. I'll be honest with you guys. Who's looking forward to getting married? Come on, man, raise your hands. Stop pretending, yeah? Everyone. It's not a bed of roses. Who's married here? Who's married? One, two, three. I feel your pain. Yeah? We know it's not a bed of roses. We've been told, oh yeah, it's like this, it's like that, yeah? When you get married, it's like rainbows and unicorns and flying men with horses. No. It's different. It's totally different. That's life. You know, you're told something. You know, this is great. If you go on, if you, if you get this car, if you get this trip or this particular wife or whatever, yeah, it's just meaningless. You, when you actually try to fulfill yourself through those material things, you eventually realize, no, you know, this isn't as good as I thought it was. So, from an Islamic perspective, Allah gives us a clear root of happiness. And that clear root of happiness, what's amazing about that, is it's not the type of happiness that Tony Robbins, Zig Zagler and all those 
psychologists speak about, which is a type of empty happiness, which is, don't worry, you know, pain is pain, you know, but you can get through it. It's, it's all, you know, they've done research about motivation, yeah? You really get pumped up, yeah? Someone just takes you, and drills in you, you're the best person, don't worry, you can deal with everything in life. Research shows it only lasts 38 days. It only lasts 38 days, right? It's, it, the true motivation is something which should not dissipate after 38 days. And the thing is, the root Allah gives in the Quran is this. Allah says, in his remembrance do hearts find peace. Now, when we read this verse, we've become so desensitized to it. We've become like, oh, you know, um, oh yeah, it's just that thing, yeah, doing zikr makes you... No, but if you really internalize it and apply it in your life, Wallahi, it'll change your life. You know, one of, uh, one of my friends, he's from a Jamaican background, uh, he was agnostic and he accepted Islam some 12 years ago. He once said something to me which literally shook my soul. Literally shook my soul. He said, Sabur, when you mess up as a Muslim, you do something that's messed up, or you're going through a downer, you're going through a bender, you're going through this or that, you can always turn back to Allah. But I, as a kafir, I had nobody to turn to. And he said it in such a deep way that I knew exactly what he was talking about. So the fact is, we need to realize. This is a treasure of Allah that Allah is giving us the secret. The secret is that in Allah's remembrance do hearts find peace. However, Islam makes it clear life is not a bed of roses. Allah says, He shall test us with good and evil. We don't have this Pentecostal idea that oh yeah if you're rich God loves you if you're poor God doesn't love you no you could be poor you could be rich you could have status or not have status you could be black white whatever it's the real thing which makes a difference is your taqwa right your your consciousness mindfulness of Allah so Islamic pursuit of happiness is not rocket science it's pretty simple However, it's very practical. And there's a Palestinian scholar who is quite well known in Europe, and he deals with a lot of cases of people who've been through trauma, who've been through difficulty, who've been through all these types of pains. And, you know, people go through a lot in life. And somebody asked him, you know, what do I do? You know, I'm going through this problem. Some people, they turn away from Allah and they say, right, I do not believe in anything. Some people, they're like, I'm confused now. And he just gave a very simple reminder, which I thought was profound. He said, what choice do you really have? If you're facing a problem, you can face it with Allah, or you can face it without Allah, but the problem is still going to be there. It's only going to be a lot easier with Allah. Compare that paradigm. Just look at that powerful paradigm, which we're going to go back to in a second. With another paradigm, and by the way, I'm, you guys are all above 18, right? Fine. And no one's recording, so I'm going to say it. Okay, so you have another paradigm, yeah? This is the actual course I went to about, you know, positivity, psychology, overcoming hurdles, yeah? So... The guy, um, I think he was from like a Jewish background or something, right? He's an atheist and he's there talking to everyone. Look, life, any problems you have in life, you can deal with it. It's just about your mind, how you think about it, and this and this and this. And everyone in the audience is like, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, they're like lapping it up. Anyway, so the way it happens is people stand up and they explain their problems. Yeah? So, and then what he does with their problems is he's supposed to be the magician to make them go away. To make them re-engineer their problem right so this woman stood up and I was sitting there and everyone else was sitting there and she stood up and she was a bit shy in the beginning but this is a very weird type of environment where everybody stands up and you have to openly say what happened to you what you went through and 
how you want to break through it. So she basically said, look, I was raped, right? I was raped. That's what happened to me. And everyone in the audience says, like, quiet. And the guy goes, okay, so what is rape? And she's like, well, I was, it was against my will and this and this and this. He said, no, you're just telling yourself a drama. This is just a story you've made. What is rape? This is just a concept. It was just two bodies and liquid. That's what it was. And I'm sitting there horrified. Is this the best answer you have? to this woman that's been traumatized. And then I was trying to think, why on earth is he trying to give her that answer, that crude, crude answer? And then when I started retracing my steps, I started to realize actually, from his perspective, that is the answer. There is no other answer. Because if we accept the paradigm of atheism, if you imagine there's a poor child that's begging and somebody goes up to the child and gives it food and there's another child same like this one poor and begging and another person goes up and kicks the child from an atheist perspective this is particles that's particles it's just two different rearrangement of particles there is no intrinsic evil and this is important to understand because I sometimes come across brown atheists. Very rare, but brown atheists. I don't mind dealing with white atheists, but brown atheists I have a really hard time dealing with, right? I usually don't debate brown atheists, if you know what I mean. And the reason is, well, well actually, I'll, maybe we can get into that reason later. But anyway, so they come up with this argument about evil. Oh, if there's no God, why is there evil in the world, you know? Um, why does this happen and why does that happen and then when you try and ask them anything they say oh but read Richard Dawkins you know Richard Dawkins it's like you know we say Kala Allah Kala Rasul they say Kala Dawkins yeah? <laughs> so but the problem is you actually have to teach them come here my little son teach them atheism and then slap them because they don't understand they tell you to read Richard Dawkins when they haven't read Richard Dawkins themselves here's what Richard Dawkins says in the river out of Eden he says this universe has precisely the properties we should expect if there's no God. There is no design, there is no right, there is no wrong, there is no good, there is no evil. He's being consistent. At least he's saying, look, fundamentally there is no evil or good in the universe. It's just rearrangement of particles. So this whole idea of, look, we're going to deal with these types of problems in life and th people go through traumatic experiences rape the death of a lev loved one cancer um, financial loss severe severe issues things that shake people and the best answer you have from the supposed free thinkers is particles if you're matter it truly really doesn't matter and that is their psychology fundamentally because they have no other answer However, let's, let's look back at the Islamic paradigm. The Islamic paradigm says, this life is like you have a vast ocean and you put your finger into the water, you bring it out and you have one drop. That's this life. The ocean, the endless ocean is eternity. The person that will go through the most severe pain and trauma and difficulty in this life, when they go to paradise for a millisecond, for a moment, they will be asked, did you go through any pain, difficulty, trials? Say, no, I'm fine, I'm great. And the person who's lived the most luxurious life, life of desire, vice, everything they want, they put into hellfire for a microsecond moment. Did you have any good in this world? They'll say, no, we did not have any good in this world. So the fact is, from an Islamic paradigm, we do believe there is good and evil in the universe. And we do believe that this life, Allah didn't create for us to just have a cosmic disco party. Allah created this life to test us with good and evil. And there's no person on the face of the earth except that they're going to have some level of good and some level of evil. 
and this is something which is much more beautiful than this cold materialist reductionist point of view because that's not what we are as human beings yeah emotions love fear these things are not just you know chemical reactions these things have intrinsic meaning for us and the powerful thing about the Islamic worldview Islam doesn't promise you euphoric endless happiness except in the hereafter in this life it gives you practical happiness so you will be happy at times but Allah also says he's the one who makes you laugh and he's the one who makes you cry yeah Allah attributes that to himself so in this life you will have hardships but Allah will give you contentment Allah will give you help and that is very much different to the pursuit of happiness the mirage that's built up about this type of endless happiness which is propagated by positive psychologists that type of happiness and I've sometimes seen by the way I've sometimes seen Muslims accept that right and then they just chuck in a bit of Quran a bit of Hadith and they say alright this is Islamic positive psychology this is just a psychologist wearing a kufi yeah it's not intrinsically Islamic because that type of happiness even when I was you know when I was at university and I wasn't really you know practicing and stuff when I was looking into Islam myself even I understood that that kind of happiness is nonsense that type of happiness doesn't exist anywhere in the world there was a there's some guy um, I just I, I don't remember the exact story but let me just let me just say I'm not sure exactly what the story is but you have people who advise other people about happiness and they're taking antidepressants themselves Jordan is, is it Jordan Peterson? Yeah. I don't know if it was fake news though. Is that true? It's the truth. It's the truth. It's the truth. It's the truth. He's in a rehab. Thank God. So I just, you know, it's, it's like when you go to a, go to a mosque and someone just chucks out some free hadith and you're like, Where, where's the new? Where's the new? <laughs> I don't want to say the name, yeah? Okay, but there you go. The guy, he's, he's written that book. What's it called? 12, 12 Rules for Radicals or 12 Rules for I Life? Life. And you know, he, he himself is, I think he was because of his wife or something, yeah. his wife got cancer. Okay. And that's the thing. That's the thing. You know, when your operating system is la ilaha illallah, you can deal with anything. But when your operating system is la ilaha, or if your operating system for the brown Desi liberals here, not here, but here, as in within Pakistan, is where your operating system is la ilaha illallah but within it a bit of feminism, a bit of liberalism, a bit of humanism, a bit of buddhism then you're not really going to function properly when you have a blockade to your road of happiness so what we need to realize the pursuit of happiness in Islam it is practical it is useful and it is something which doesn't promise the type of euphoric happiness that positive psychology gives. However, it is also something which we believe overall, overall, when you look at the grand scheme of things, that type of euphoric positive happiness which they promise, which people never get to, we do believe in Jannah that that is the type of happiness that human beings will have okay um, so I want you to give a quick sort of summary about what I was going to speak about today before I pick on anyone is there any questions comments suggestions yes sir yes Yes. You see, the data that comes out of those countries, I think, is, by the way, it's a very good question. The data that comes out of those, co those countries, I get confused by that data. And the reason I get confused by that data is if you look at the same percentage of the population that's on antidepressants and on all sorts of therapies for um, depression, it's a lot higher than places like Bangladesh. So, how, 
how do I make sense of that data? Well, I would say the data is not decisive there. Because even the way, for example, some of the way, like one, one piece of data that I do know of, uh, not in terms of uh, numbers, but in terms of the way that it's actually derived at, is when standard of living is calculated. Yeah? So when standards of living is calculated, they are uh, calculated in a way where it's like, okay, so if you can basically earn above this much dollars, if you have access to the job market, if you have this, if you have that, and they come up with a figure. So according to that standard of living, Japan is like number one. It's like number one, right? I believe if I'm not wrong, they are the number three or two economies in the world. I'm not sure what they are. But for their, for their size, it's like them. However, ja Japanese society, they are materialistic and they have you know, all this economic wealth and whatnot. Yet, the data that we do have, which is done by the government in Japan, is that they have a massive problem with depression and suicide. Huge problem, right? I went to Japan in 2015. And the weirdest thing I found there is that people, because of the, you know, the capitalist dream, they are happy to say that I choose my career over my family, right? So from the happiness index point of view, I don't think the way that these things are calculated are most accurate. Because I've, I've heard atheists use Norway uh, and uh, Scandinavian countries as examples, but then they never talk about Japan which in fact is wealthier than these countries and it's worse. So this data isn't conclusive. However, one thing which is very, very clear is this. A civilization which is based on the idea, the ideas of materialism. So, you know, you just have material goods and these types of things. You will find within those civilizations People are continuously searching for a higher meaning. There's an interesting uh, phenomenon happening in China. Do you know the statistics about China? China went through this transformation last like 30 years. 10% of their population was uh, doing okay, 90% was under the poverty line. Do you remember? Have you guys heard of this pyramid? And now it's the opposite. China is wealth, like a lot more wealthy and they have, I think, less than 5% which are under poverty. So majority of the population is now above the poverty line. While this trend happened, that China went from being very poor to relatively wealthy, another phenomena which actually happened was the spread of Christianity in China. China is due to become by 2050, the largest Christian nation on earth. Not by percentage, by numbers. It's going to be the largest Christian nation on earth. And people are trying to work out what the heck happened. Chinese were atheists, very much so in the uh, 70s and 60s. Why are they going towards religion? And one of the answers given, which of course there's rival answers to this, but I'm more inclined towards this one, is that once they got out of that poverty trap, and they became okay, then they had basically thought, okay, is that it? <laughs> Which is what Jim Carrey went through, yeah? Is that it? Is, is this life, you know? Is this all I'm gonna uh, uh, get out of it? Did that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? So, let me do a quick poll. With the problem of evil, how many people here have actually come across somebody, or it could be yourself, for, that you know that this has been a real big issue for people? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, without naming names, can anyone go through, not the problem itself, but the ways in which people try to deal with it and whether those are successful or not. Okay. 
So someone's going through a problem of you. Could be yourself, could be a friend, could be someone else. What strategies to get back onto the track of the road of happiness? Were employed and were those successful? Like I can, I don't mind talking. I can speak about recently, uh, less than three years ago, my mum passed away. So I can, I can give you my own personal example, but you know, I'd rather not do that. I'd rather hear from people, yeah? Like, what I'm really trying to get to is that when I speak to people, when I speak to non-Muslims, this is one topic that although when you're trying to talk to them about Islam, they don't want to listen. If you're trying to talk to them about this, they don't want to listen. When it comes to this particular topic and the related topic of the purpose of life, it really makes people go out of their comfort zone in, in, in terms of um, cures that they look for, for this. Yeah? So explaining about a particular issue and how someone dealt with it and whether that was successful. Okay, who wants to go first? Yes. I feel like the only way you can use it that is uh, through religion. So the only way you can account for even yes. is if there is a hereafter. Yes. If all actions will be accounted for. So if evil happens in this world, it's trivial as compared to what you will get towards the hereafter. Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is something which I try and um, I try and use in my dawah when I'm speaking to people, right? So I met this non-Muslim English guy in 2010. So this guy went through a lot of trauma. He went through a lot of difficulty. And the thing about him was that his son had mental illness. He was very close to his mother and his mother died. And he was going through this continuous pain and traditionally, the way the English people are is they're not Christian unless it's Christmas, someone dies or someone's born or someone gets married. That's it. Yeah. So the first thing he tried to do was he tried to go to the religion of his parents, which is Christianity, to try and look for an answer to the problem of evil. He didn't find it. Interesting pop quiz, right? What's their conception of the problem of evil? Christians. The salvation. Salvation, yes, there's that, but in terms of the existence of evil, not how you get rid of the evil, the existence of evil. Yes, yes, yes. Good, perfect. So the first thing is they believe we are inherently sinful, evil. Okay, so the opposite end with us as Muslims, we believe human beings are inherently good. What's the evidence for that? That's the evidence for that. Okay, so when even the Quraysh they were being called to Islam, they still had good traits which were fitri, which the Prophet ﷺ was trying to enhance. Okay, so that's good. The other difference between us and Christianity in terms of the problem of evil. Yes. Yes. Yes, that's the exit through the world of sin, the world of evil. What, okay, if there's evil in the world, how would the Christian pastor explain that evil? That's a more explicit way of putting this question. I think it's because uh, we're inherently, because of the sin that we do, it was something we had. Very close, very close. Free will. So what Christians say as an answer to the problem of evil is they say evil exists in the world because human beings are given free will so then what they do is that they take evil and they dump it on human beings they do not accept any evil can be the will of God we as Muslims we don't believe the will of God is evil but we believe that Allah he ultimately will test us with good and evil why this distinction is important is this if a natural disaster like a tsunami happens christians can't say it was the problem of evil they can't say that it's free will 
because there's no a human agency involved in the hurricane or the tornado or whatever it is. As Muslims, we do have an answer, and the answer is that Allah created us to be tested with good and evil. So the classical question which the Greeks used to ask to challenge God, if God is all good and God is all powerful, whence the evil? Yeah? The classical paradox. Muslims can break that paradox because we can say, you've just made a straw man. You've said God is good. God is all powerful. We say God is also the wise. And God is the judge. He's the one who will test us and judge us. And evil inherently, we believe, and good is going to be, every single human being is going to be tested according to that. This is very important to understand because what I've seen is that this problem leads people away from God. Anyone familiar with why Charles Darwin stopped believing in God? Okay, firstly, anyone aware of Charles Darwin's personal sort of beliefs about God? Very, very interesting. There's a book by Nick Spencer called Darwin and God. Nick Spencer, what he does is he takes the classical views that people have about Darwin and he basically just destroys them. He basically says, look, Darwin didn't believe these things because, you know, obviously at the time Darwin was around, um, uh, a lot of his personal letters, personal diaries and those things, they were inaccessible to the public. So Nick Spencer, what he did is that he went in to the archives and he found Darwin's writings and the different sort of letters he wrote to people. So what's very interesting in that book, uh, Darwin and God, is that Darwin was first a Christian and then he left Christianity around the age of 30. Okay? Once he left Christianity, he became a deist. Everyone familiar with what a deist is? A deist is someone who says that they acknowledge there's a God, but they don't acknowledge God interferes with the world. God just created the world, there's no religion, you know, everything's running by itself. So, when he was writing on natural selection and uh, observing and the Galapagos Islands and all the rest of the travels he was doing, according to his biographers and historians, he did have a firm belief in God. His belief in God did not become redundant because of his discovery of natural selection, evolution by natural selection. So what he did is that he carried on that belief in God until he published The Origin of Species. It's very clear he still believed in God at that point. In fact, we have writings of him before the book is published in 1859 and after, where he does explicitly state to his friends in private letters and in his diary that he does believe in a created God. However, he started to go through some very serious problems which were nagging away at his belief. And those were that he really loved his daughter and she, put, she died. He also had a son who passed away at two. And he himself was going through a lot of health issues, even when he was writing The Origin. So the problem of evil was nagging him away. And what happened, according to Michael Roos, who's one of, his, uh, one of the uh, great Darwinian sort of uh, academics today, is that in the last decade of his life, that problem of evil, it, overca it overcame him. So he went from being a deist to an agnostic. Now it's very interesting is this. He himself writes that although I went from being a believer in God to being an agnostic, I do not deny God. So he's, he's very clear that he was a he's very unclear about the issue however what he tried to do next is very interesting so he writes look in my wildest fluctuations I was never an atheist like even if, if when I was going through that crisis of faith I was never an atheist and one of the reasons for him not being an atheist was that the world and the way the world is for him that was a big big sign Right? He didn't believe God was actively involved in the world, but you get a snippet 
of his thinking, when he published the first Origin of Species, and there was actually six uh, publications, when he published the first version, in the first version, he says, uh, no, sorry, a reviewer said about the book. There was a reviewer who accepted Darwin's ideas, but accepted that God is the author of all of life. So they, this particular um, reviewer, they wrote, if God created one original form of life, which evolved into all species today, which is the tree of life, or if God created individual species, which then branched out. So whether you had parallel lines of multiple origins or one origin with all of life stemming from that, this reviewer said it would be just as noble for God to do this or to do that. It doesn't take away from the greatness of God. Darwin was so impressed with those words that he put them in the second origin of species. So it goes to show you that he wasn't anti-God. However, when the problem of evil overtook him, like other Christians, former Christians, he went back to Christianity to try and find an answer. And again, he heard the same answer. It's because of free will. And he couldn't actually understand that. Because when he looked at nature, in nature, for example, you have animals eating other animals. You have animals attacking human beings. You have this explanation of the free will in human beings is supposed to explain away the problem of evil. But nature, how do you explain that? Because animals are not supposed to have free will. So Darwin became dissatisfied with the answers of Christianity. And the reason why I'm highlighting this is to show you guys that when you are conveying the message of Islam, the problem of evil and the Islamic answer to it, which is linked to the pursuit of happiness, this can be the one thing that can trigger somebody from leaving what they're upon to coming into Islam. And this is exactly what happened to my friend. His answers, the answers that he was getting from Christianity were poor. He said to me, when I discovered the Islamic theology, the Islamic answer to why things happen, he said, my heart was settled upon that. And he said, this is why he accepted Islam. Now, sometimes when we convey Islam, we go up to people, we say to them, oh, in Islam, there's scientific miracles in the Quran, there's this, there's that, there's this prophecy. We talk to people like they're robots. Yeah? You give someone information, you get out some information, you put in some more information, eventually you have this rational algorithm and then Iman comes into their hearts. No. Human beings do not act like that. Every human being is different. And understanding the pursuit of happiness, understanding the problem of evil, is an extremely powerful way of bringing people into Islam. Now, from your perspective, this wouldn't really apply to bringing non-Muslims into Islam. This would maybe be more applicable in terms of getting non-practicing Muslims back into Islam. Just here in Lahore, there was a funny story my friend was telling me um, that there was a lady whose husband passed away and she was very, very secular and her daughter-in-law was in Akabi and she didn't like her daughter-in-law and because in their entire family the son was practicing, nobody in the family was practicing and then the son married a Nikabi which was against the mother's wishes. That mother, being like most mother-in-laws, had a very uneasy relationship with the daughter-in-law, especially because of religion. However, my friends told me something very interesting. He told me, although they had a very bad relationship, and obviously the daughter-in-law was trying to be the best example, and none of that was working. As soon as the father-in-law the man's, uh, the, uh, the, the mother-in-law's husband, as soon as he died in a freak accident, 
which was unexpected. Basically, he walked into a lift, and the lift it was dark, and the lift hadn't come. He just fell to his death. He was like a big business, um, business mongol or whatever. She was shocked by the problem of evil, and then the comfort which was given by her religious daughter-in-law, and that totally changed her paradigm. And that just goes to show you, as another example, that you know, understanding these things is very important. Every Muslim is a caller to Allah, right? Every Muslim is a caller to Allah in their own capacity. And we really need to understand people's psychology. Fundamentally, everybody wants to be happy. Yeah? Everybody wants to be happy. But that happiness, we need to define exactly what it means. All right? We need to tell them, look, Islam will give you happiness, but not that type of happiness. And this happiness is something which we believe you, even though you go through tests and trials, it'll turn into contentment and there's still ways of actually dealing with it. Okay. Any other questions? I can just keep talking online. That's the problem. I, 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 like, to, I like it to be more interactive. Yes. I have a question. Yes. So it's linked to predestination. Predestination. Yeah, so like, uh, if it's written like your life, like from start to finish, and it also means that evil is also written. In yes. Life. So that means that God also put that in the Yes. Let me regurgitate the problem. The classical problem of free will versus predestination. Now, for 1400 years of Islamic scholarship and before that in uh, Christian theological and Jewish theological circles, they've tried to work out this problem. How do you have the fact that we have been predestined and that we are told we have free will, we can make choices? There is a lot of ink that's been spilled trying to explain this. From my understanding of this topic and the scholars that I follow and when they try to explain this topic, the most satisfactory answer that I found is you cannot make logical sense of it. That's, that's for me. So every time I've heard an answer, because when I was not practicing, that was one of my questions as well, like how does this make any sense? So there's a concept I need to extrapolate, and it's very good you asked this question. Something doesn't, not making sense to us doesn't mean it's false. This is a, a, um, a hasty jump we sometimes make. So it's not making sense to me, boom, it's false. And this is a problem which, it does exist more in contemporary times, but it did exist in ancient times as well. So let's retrace to a few examples to show that it's not the case that something is false because we don't understand it. Okay. If we take this ancient city of Lahore and we take a very intelligent person from Lahore 500 years ago and one of us was to do a time travel and go back and tell this person in the future there is going to be a city like Lahore which can play a live cricket match which is being watched in Delhi and while the match is happening you have lots and lots of fans who are using satellites to communicate with each other using this platform called Twitter and you explain to them electricity and you know how AI works and you you just explain to them this magical world that we live in. They would find that extremely hard to believe. It wouldn't actually make any sense to them. Likewise, if we go back to Sir Isaac Newton, very mathematical, very analytical genius, and we basically say to him, Sir Isaac, you know this beautiful world you have of your time and space being fixed, and these equations that we are using to make precise predictions which are confirmed. And I know you're 
Newtonian paradigm has worked well for 200 years. However, let me just explain to you something. So Isaac, all of that is wrong. Time and space is actually not fixed. It's like cloth, it's flexible. And welcome to the world of quantum reality, right? Where an, a particular particle, it acts differently if it's being observed to when it's not being observed, where something can be supposedly in two places at the same time, and they, we have a very successful quantum theory, although the interpretations, no one really agrees with. You try and say this even to a math, mathematical genius like Newton, he would find that extremely hard to believe, because that's going to be stretching the limits of his understanding, right? Not stretching, destroying, right? Getting rid of. So for us, how do we explain this? The first thing we say is, look, if something doesn't make sense to you, it doesn't mean it's not true. And we can establish that using other examples. So then the question is not, okay, how can this be? The question is, why do we believe it? And what I usually do and what other du'at usually do is they just retrace the question back to why we believe the Qur'an is true. Because if the Qur'an is true and the Qur'an tells us X and Y, and X and Y seem in our mind to contradict each other, if the contradiction is not in reality, it's actually in our minds. This is the exact same problem the Quraysh had. So Allah's Messenger is telling the Quraysh, here is proof Islam is true. He's giving them the truth of Islam. And in the Quran, there's a mention of a tree. And you remember that tree in the Quran that the Quraysh were laughing at? There's a tree in the Quran which is mentioned. Yes. At the top. At the top? Uh, at the end of the Do you remember the verses? I don't remember the verses. I, no, the verses where the Quraysh are mocking the tree. Anyway, so the Quraysh were laughing and they were saying, how can a tree grow in Jahannam when we know wood burns in fire? So what they were saying is, we know what happens to fire and wood. You, the supposed prophet, you're telling us there's a hellfire that's so hot. And you're telling me this miskeen piece of wood is going to grow in there? I mean... You put wood in lava, what happens? Let alone fire, lava, what happens? Hellfire is worse. And Allah says in the Quran, this tree is a fitna for them. And this is the same fitna that Bani Israel went through. Okay, where did they go through that fitna? Quick, quick quiz on the Quran. Where did they go through that fitna between what Allah told them and what their reason told them? No, the sea, sit the, the sea splitting was a miracle which Allah gave them. They believed in it. Something else where they could not accept something rationally and they disobeyed Allah. So was it that they could not fish on Saturday? No. no. Can you repeat the question? Okay. The question basically is this, yeah? So, where in the Quran do we have the children of Israel basically disobeying Allah because they cannot understand what Allah said. Oh, no, because they cannot rationalize what Allah said. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, what is the story of the cow? What happened? Uh, Allah said you need to slaughter a cow. Why? Just because of it. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, someone was no. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, go on, carry on. Okay. I don't remember, but so, uh, so, hmm? Allah told a guy to sell a cow for a lot of money, right? No, then you're no good, one, but then you're going off the road. No one, <laughs> get close, though, close. No one was aware why the high price, but then people just did it. Close, close, yes. Like someone was murdered and yes. they were trying to find who killed him. Yes. So the, the people asked the other Isa. Yes. Musa. 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 So they, they said if there should be a proper car, there should be slaughtered, and then we could be born and then. Yes. Yes. 
So then what were they told to do with the slaughtered cow? So they take a cow, look, a murder took place, you take a cow, bring the cow, slaughter the cow, then what? Do something with the meat. And, uh, do what with the meat? Eat it? Traditional Pakistani, especially the whole world. <laughs> meat, eat it. <laughs> you guys have no vegetarians at least. I can make that joke. I'm from Murray and we, we're more vegetarian. <laughs> um, so what happened with the meat? What did what they told to do with the meat? I think the murdered person was supposed to be written back meat. Yes, perfect. Perfect. Jazakallah khair, sister. There we go. So, guy's been murdered. They go to Allah's messenger, Musa alayhi salam. What do we do? Musa says, get a cow, slaughter the cow. Take the meat of the cow. Hit the dead person. Here's where we're going to bring in Ibn Taymiyyah. Okay? Anyone heard of this ancient medieval scholar? If you haven't, you're really missing out. Right? So Ibn Taymiyyah, he was an ancient, not ancient, he's a medieval Muslim scholar, but he was far ahead of his time. And he gives an example which is a bit long, so I'm going to modernize it and I'm going to try and get, uh, explain it to you guys. So the example is this. You have somebody who's ill, somebody who is, say, um, they, they're a simple person who drives a rickshaw in the hall. This person has an illness and they're very poor. So what they do is they try and go to the hospital to try and get a cure. They don't have money. So somebody says, look, I'm going to give you money. Just go and go into this hospital where there's this really high-end doctor and he is going to help you out. So now this poor person, very simple person, comes in and sits down in the offices of the main hospital in Lahore and supposedly the best doctor in Lahore. Now, the doctor, behind him, he has certificates. So, he graduated from Harvard, he did this, he did this, he did this, he did this. He did all these things. He's got all these different credentials and proves that he is who he is. Now, when this person asks the doctor, I have this symptom, this symptom, this symptom, this symptom. And the doctor says, okay, no problem, young man. I know what this is. I have helped many people with this particular problem before. And I, this is what I did my dissertation on in university and X, Y, Z. Okay. Here is the cure. He writes down medicine X, medicine Y, medicine Z. Some medicines which ingredients this person has never heard of. Okay. His logic led him to the doctor. He could have woken up that morning, felt sick, and he could have gone to the baker, he could have gone to the lawyer, or he could have gone to the doctor, which was a lo logical thing to do, go to the doctor. When he went to the doctor, he verified, okay, this is the doctor, this is the hospital, these are all of the proofs, this is the doctor. Now, the doctor gives him a prescription, which he doesn't understand, he hasn't done the experiments to make sure that those medicines work. Should he accept the medicine and take it? Or should he say, I don't know if you're the doctor. How do I know this medicine works? Where's the peer-reviewed journals? How do I know that these patients that you actually helped were helped using this medicine and not another medicine? Would he ask you a million questions or would he just take the medicine? He'd take the medicine. Let's retrace the steps. What Ibn Taymiyyah says is that the person came to the doctor using his mind. He verified the truth. Once it was verified, then he is given something and he has to accept it blindly. So Ibn Taymiyyah gives the example in terms of revelation. He says the revelation of the Quran can be recognized by the mind. 
But once you recognize it's the truth, you submit to the truth even if you don't understand it. Okay? Likewise, when it comes to the question of Qadr, or it comes to the question of how a tree can burn in Jahannam, or any of these things, once it's verified for you that this is the truth, then you follow it. Now what happened to Bani Israel, the chronology is very important here, very important. When they were told to obey the commandment of Allah, was this before the sea parted or after the sea parted? After. After. What's the significance of the sea parting? They saw the miracle, meaning they should not ever doubt Allah after that. They were given evidence. So they were given evidence of the truth of Islam. Musa salam, they were doubting even up to the last moment, even though they saw miracles before that. The snake, yeah, they saw the miracles. When he stuck at the sea, what did the Bani Israel say? Well, that's it, we're finished. And Musa salam, said, no, Allah will guide me. Another miracle, the sea parted, they went over. Now, when a murder took place, Allah is telling them something that doesn't make sense. Take a cow, sacrifice a cow, take the meat, hit the dead person. Allah could have just said he committed the murder because they were trying to find out who the murder, murderer was. However, Allah told them to do something which didn't make sense to, in their minds. Allah could have said, Kun Faikun, and the dead person could have come back to life. However, when they reluctantly picked up the meat, hit the dead person, he came back to life and he said he committed the murder and then he died again. Allah could have done that without the cow. What was the purpose of the cow? To test them whether they believe in Allah in something which doesn't make sense to them. After they've seen miracles. A similar story we get from chapter 5 of the Quran, Surah Maida. At the end of Surah Maida, the helpers of Isa alayhi salam, they believe in Isa alayhi salam, but then they also say, Oh Allah, send down a table from the heavens so that we do not doubt in you or your messenger. Right? What does Allah say to their request? Very interesting. What does Allah say to them? Perfect. Jazakallah Allah says, He will send down that miracle to them. But if they disbelieve after this, then they will face a punishment that no one's ever faced before. Likewise, in the life of every person, Muslim, non-Muslim, anybody who wants true guidance, whichever century you live in, Allah will give you signs personally in your life, evidences in your life, which are the equivalent of the moon splitting for you. It may not make sense to anybody else. But once Allah gives you that internal guidance and truth, then your job is not to question. And people get confused. They say, wait, hang on a second. Are you telling us that we blindly follow in Islam? And the answer is yes. But they say, hang on, in Islam, Allah says, use your reason, use your mind. Don't you reflect, don't you think. Allah says the worst creation is those who don't use their aql. So they say, you're, you're contradicting the Quran, because the Quran is all about rationality. See, this is where there is a category mistake. Allah says to use your reason again and again. But that's to recognize the truth. And Allah says, سَمِئْنَا وَاتَعْنَا Once you recognize it's the truth. So the blind following and the rationality, even the blind following is rational because you fundamentally came to Islam, like Ibn Taymiyyah said, through the rational route. So when it comes to Qadr, I know it's a bit of a long-winded way of explaining it, Qadr or any issue with somebody, it doesn't make sense to them. Like somebody, I don't know if this phenomenon has happened here, I've come across Muslims who doubt the job. They're like, how, how does this, where's this person? You know, he's hiding somewhere and he's going to control the world. And then they start saying, no, the jal is actually a system and it's the TV, it's the one eye. Yeah? This is a lack of iman. That's what it is. If Allah's Messenger said, there is this person, the logic, I mean, you shouldn't, you shouldn't use your rationality to undermine the truth once you recognize it. 
So I know it doesn't make sense that there's Dajjal who's existed for God knows how long. Maybe Dajjal is thousands of years old. We don't know. What we do know is Dajjal was alive at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. We know that for sure. That's something we know. Yeah, because some of the Sahaba, they, they give us a story about that. But what we need to do as Muslims, what we need to convey to non-Muslims is, once you establish something's true, don't choose your akal over it. Yes. Can we use the same answer that you gave about the decree when we are asked to, when a question arises in our mind that if someone is homosexual and they are made by Allah and they like attract the same gender, they made by Allah. So what do they do then? Yes. Or like what is the ruling of Islam in that case? Yes. So can we use the same answer you use as you said right now in this case as well? Yes. Not only. Should we use that answer? That is the classical answer which was used by scholars for any issue. Because there are cases, I mean, we're just talking about homosexuality here. But a much more prevalent problem which does exist in the world is where people get married and they're still attracted to someone outside of marriage. That's a prevalent problem, right? Just like homosexuality is a, is a desire which is forbidden, that desire is forbidden too. And that is the same problem. This, the desire itself doesn't make you guilty. Scholars say the desire itself doesn't make you guilty. It's the acting upon the desire, the action upon the desire. So whether it's a man and his wife's neighbor, or it's a man and another man, or a woman and another woman, it's the same thing. And one of the questions that I sometimes get is, Okay, I'm going to try to extrapolate it to make it much more easier. You can extrapolate this into many different questions. Why do we pray five times a day and not seven times a day? Yeah? Why is it in Islam that we face the Qibla? Why is it the Quran is sitting down in Arabic and not French? Yeah? You can come up with an endless amount of questions. Can I also add another question? Yes. Which might fall in this yes. category. Like, uh, I don't know if I'm right saying this. Like in, there's a friend of mine who says, like, uh, if uh, Bukhari and Muslim, yeah. they collected the Ahadis, yes. like after some time that passed, and then they collected after the demise of the Prophet, peace upon him. So, how can we be sure that Quran says, uh, in Quran, Allah says that I, I will take care of my book? Yes. So, we have this, this promise about Quran. They can, about these books, so how can we be sure that Bukhari and Muslim collected the ahadith in the right manner yes. and the ahadith which, which are transmitted to us because it's like 1200 years, 1300 years that have passed since uh, they have been compiled. So how can we be sure that those ahadith are in the same intact manner? Good. Very good question. Very, very good question. Okay. We wouldn't answer it like this. We wouldn't answer it the way we did it now because that's a completely different question. Yeah? So the way we would answer it is by going into the Hadith sciences. So that was actually, I'm very happy you raised that. That was one of my issues when I was at university. Yeah? That I was like, okay, so like, how, did, how do we know these were preserved? So for this, we have to actually do a, even a crash course in terms of how these narrations of the Prophet ﷺ were compiled. I'm just going to give you the gist of it. The gist of it is this. The way that these things were compiled were through Isnad, right? So they were, they were testimonies which were independent, which were recorded. If somebody takes the science of Hadith and then says, I don't accept it, then they have to be consistent and they have to reject the existence of Napoleon, Plato, Anaximander, Socrates, Genghis Khan, every single historical figure. Because we do not know the existence of her historical figures through empiricism. We know of the existence of historical figures and historical events through, the, uh, through uh, testimony. Yeah? Testimony is actually a valid source of knowledge in epistemology. So, if someone looks at the science of, sciences of hadith, you can question it and you can say, how does this make sense? How does that make sense? How does that Islam make sense? But you can 
what you can't do is just brush aside the whole science of it and say that just doesn't make any sense because it happened 200 years after the death of the Prophet and when I looked into this science yeah, it is very very difficult to doubt it after that point it's very very difficult because the same way that we have the Quran preserved hadith were preserved in a similar way and you know what's powerful? Even weak hadith and fabricated hadith were taken and compiled. And they were put under the categories of false and weak. So everything was recorded. You know when you have a, uh, a whitewashing going on, yeah? you just get, keep the good stuff, get rid of the bad stuff. Yeah? In Islamic history, we completely recorded everything. And what's powerful is at the time the hadith were recorded, if there was a chance for manipulation, the most powerful, the most powerful cause for that would have been political. So a political dynasty would have forged hadith in its favor. However, when the hadith were being compiled, they were speaking, some of the hadith were speaking negatively about the very people who happened to be in power. And here I'm referring to the Umayyads. Yeah? So, if there was a chance to tamper with it, it would have happened. And you would have found during the Abbasids, during the Umayyads, during the Mamluks, during the Ottomans, during the other dynasties that we had in history, you'd find completely different hadith going on. But what you find is a consistent pattern. And another way of thinking about it is this. Allah Himself says in the Quran, in the Messenger of God, there is an excellent example for those who believe in God in the last day, right? Throughout the Quran, Allah speaks about the Prophet ﷺ as an example. But if we deny hadith, we can't even say the Prophet ﷺ was born in Makkah or born 1400 years ago. It's gone. And the problem with the people who deny hadith, and this is my experience so far, where I've, uh, I've had discussions with them, they seem to deny the hadith which don't fit in line with a white man's liberal idea. They don't have a problem with charity doesn't decrease wealth. Yeah? They don't have a problem with, you know, love for others what you love for yourself. They don't have a problem with that. The, the ones which are questioned are the ones that don't fit in the Western secular mindset, right? And that's the ones that are problematic and, you know, we need to question. So it, it's kind of funny um, when you look at, I mean, even tomorrow there's a debate happening uh, at, I forgot which university, uh, Ustad uh, uh, Magiru Luqman and some other people Islam and modernity Does Islam need to be reformed? Yeah? So it, The real issue here is that when, when someone says Islam needs to be reformed Or this hadith doesn't make sense Because it doesn't fit our current moral, moral compass The problem with this argument is We're just assuming That The liberal worldview Which you know White Christian Europe came up with a few centuries ago, that's the default right way of living. But we should question that. Because I think the cause of the Quraniyun or the people who deny these hadith is purely an inferiority complex. And we as Muslims, we shouldn't be shy. I've had people coming up to me and saying, you know, in Islam there's chopping of the hand, in Islam there's this, in Islam there's that, in Islam there's this. I'm like, yeah, and what? We, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't have this, you know, Sometimes questions are raised as if they're questions. Yeah? So, isn't it true in Islam you have this? I'm like, yeah. I'm offended. I'm offended you don't pay jizya. You know? Like, anybody, anybody can. You, I'm offended. What does that mean? You know, you, your emotions don't affect the cosmos. Yeah? So, Quran Yun type people who have a huge problem with hijab and niqab and, you know, um, uh, oh, Eid, they've, they've started this new thing, vegetarian Eid in the UK. Yeah? Uh, female Imams. And the thing is, their moral compass keeps shifting. I've even heard this recent thing, right? Um, you've heard of, um, of course, you've heard of transgenderism, right? Some people are saying that's wrong. It should be transspeciesism. Why are human beings exceptional? Even the, when I was growing up, what I was fed 
when I was in the UK was humanism, humanism, humanism. Now, the top thinkers, and even in Pakistan, the Desi liberals, it's about humanism. Now, they're questioning humanism. They're saying, humanism discriminates against other species. Why are humans special? It should be speciesism. We as Muslims, we're not people of fashion. We don't change our religion because a new fad comes along. We're people of tradition. We have Allah and His Messenger, and whatever is preserved, we follow it. Yes? Just like the problematic ahadith which you, which you were talking about, one of the ahadiths is I don't know that how, like, uh, how, if he said he is, he's taken the hadith goes that uh, if uh, Sajda was Jayas after Allah, I would, uh, Holy Prophet Peace Man said, I would ask a woman to prostrate to her husband. Yes. So, like, uh, can you, like, shed some light upon this? Like, why is the status of man so high in Islam? And why did the Prophet say this? Okay. I'm going to make it better for you. I'm not going to give you that hadith. I'm going to give you all of them in one, in the sense of a story. Okay? Somebody who I know, they were researching Islam for 10 years and researching the supposed problematic issues of women and Islam. Okay? So women get half the inheritance, women get... You know, women are not allowed to be the Khalifa. Women are not allowed to be the Imam. Allah did not send female prophets. These things exist, right? So this particular person, they regularly used to come to uh, our Dawah stall in East London. So this lady, she was a social worker. She was from an English background, a Christian who left Christianity and became a Buddhist and was looking into Islam for about 10 years. And... Regularly, I used to speak to her about Islam. And when she used to come, I used to redirect the conversation to why Islam is true. And she used to speak about other issues. Anyway, one day, because I'd been speaking to her for so long about Islam, one day I asked her, why do you accept Islam? What's going on? Like, you, you, you have all this, you know, um, you know it's to be true. You've been researching it for years. What's the problem? She wouldn't give me an answer. So I said to her, look, do you believe in God? She said, yes. I said, do you believe the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the messenger of God? She said, yes. I said, why don't you believe? Why don't you accept Islam? Again, she went quiet. I said to her, look, just tell me what the issue is. Because you, did. she kept coming to our stall again and again. Right? And when someone keeps coming in again and again, and you can't prove to them Islam is true any longer because they already accept everything, it's kind of awkward, they just keep hanging around. <laughs> no, I'm being honest. Anyway, so she smiled and she said, look, I'm a feminist, right? And I just cannot understand some of the things in Islam. And she was asking way more difficult questions than what most Muslims have ever heard of, right? Because she even knew some Islamic fic. She used to listen to Manali Khan, Mufti Menk. She dealt with um, uh, marital problems in Islam. She had all these different, different questions. Her list of questions compared to like, the one question he asked was like endless. Yeah. So I wasn't going to go over each one. She said, look, I cannot understand this. I can't understand this. I said to her, do you believe in God and the Prophet Sallallahu being his messenger? She said, yes. I said, look, let me tell you something. I've been Muslim all my life. I don't understand this either. What I do understand is this comes from God. If my mind cannot understand it, that doesn't stop me from acknowledging this is from God. At that point, for the first time, although she'd been researching Islam for years, she decided to accept Islam. When before that, she had two different operating systems. She had La ilaha illallah and she had feminism and they were conflicting. And the problem is this, Allah has given guidance and somebody can come along and look at the guidance and say this is unfair. So feminists can come along and say the Quran is unfair because it gives half the inheritance, because a woman can't give divorce, because of um, a woman cannot, leave, uh, uh, cannot lead the prayer, a woman cannot be Khalifa, X, Y, Z. Well, guess what? A, a feminist... You guys have those here? Menin. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, Pakistan hasn't got the problem of Memonism yet. It's coming. It's coming. 
because we're gonna follow in, follow the kuffar to the, the lizard hole. We're gonna go all the way, yeah. So don't worry, it's gonna come here too. Meminism. Meminism is a new social movement which says women historically have oppressed men, and they say they use real life examples. When men go to war, the women chill out at home. Men built society. Women didn't do that. Men, men, men. So it's all about men, and it's it's, it's anti-feminist, and you know, they have their own philosophies as well. Now, a meminist can turn around and look at the Quran, and say the Quran is against men in favor of women, and the feminist can say the opposite. How so? Well, isn't it true in Islam that if you have two daughters, the ma if, you, if, you, if, you, if as a parent you have two daughters, you go to paradise for taking care of them. Mm, yeah. that, not true with two sons. The Prophet ﷺ says, whoever has a daughter, doesn't debase her, doesn't degrade her, doesn't choose her, his son over her, his son over her, he will be in paradise. He didn't say that about a boy. Okay. In the Quran, childbirth is mentioned. And what happens when the child is born? The woman who gives birth to a child, Maryam alayhi salam, she's expecting a, a woman, boy. boy. What does she get? Girl. A girl. Is she happy or complaining? She's complaining. She says, Oh Allah, I gave birth to a girl. And Allah says, the male is not like the female. Meaning the qualities of the, of the female are not in the male. Imagine if conversely, she gave birth to a boy and then she was like, oh, I wanted a girl and Allah's like, no, a boy is better for you. Feminists would have had a field day, but we don't have that. Yeah? If in Islam, a war breaks out, if a man doesn't go out and defend the borders of Islam, he, de he dies the death of a hypocrite. Not true with a woman. So... A feminist can turn around and say the Quran is against men. A feminist can turn around and say the Quran is against women. A child, you know, we have this new child rights thing, yeah, where children can make their own, they can change their sex. Yeah, they have this whole thing, yeah. A child can turn around and say, no, in Islam, you have to follow your parents, so Islam is against children. No. The Quran is guidance from Allah. The limited human mind, it will conjure up different moral compasses from different times which will conflict with the Qur'an. But the Qur'an is true because it's from Allah. The human moral compass will keep changing with society, with culture, and we don't know where it's going to be in 500 years from now. You maybe have a man marrying a dog, we don't know. Yeah? But the truthfulness of Islam is not undermined by a subjective moral idea. And by the way, these subjective moral ideas, which are prevalent today, which are asked, no one asks about the Chinese moral system or the Latino moral system. It's usually the Western moral system. And that's simply because of a human deficiency, which is any people that we see as materially more superior, we automatically link their superiority to their beliefs. This is exactly what happened with the Muslims. When the Muslims were at the zenith of their empire and Europeans traveled to Muslim countries like Adelaide of Bath, who was the first uh, scientist in England, when these people traveled from France and from other places to the Muslim land, guess what clothes they wore? We have historical documents showing this. What clothes did they wear? They wore Arab robes. They wore shalwar kameez. I'm working with a uh, historian and he was telling me that when the British first came to India, before they took over India, they felt so inferior because of the Mughals, they dressed up in shalwar kameez. But then when they started becoming rich, we started dressing like them. So even with these arguments from morality, I have never heard somebody coming up with a moral problem in Islam except that the moral problem is a law in Islam and what the Western white conception of morality is. Never about the Chinese or the Latinos. Simply because we have an inferiority complex, a colonial relic, in which we just automatically think, oh my God, 
you know, like they said this, so it must be right. I had this guy, Pakistani Murtad, right? He came over to the UK, came over from Pakistan, became enlightened, became a Murtad. So he came to the IRA office, our offices, and uh, he's like, I left Islam, Islam is nonsense, you know, blah, 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 religion is man made. So I said, okay, so like, why did you leave Islam? He says, it doesn't make sense. None of it makes sense. It's all rubbish. I was like, okay. He's like, yeah, you know, I've researched it. It's all wrong. I said, okay, no problem. Like, so what, give me like, why, why is Islam wrong? He said, you know, um, uh, there's a Sahih Muslim, it says you can drink camel urine. I said, uh, what's wrong with drinking camel urine? He's like, what? That's disgusting. I said, that's just your, your idea. That was his level of thinking. He just, because the Western moral compass is one way, this is another way. I mean, you can use the argument that urine is even used in some medicines. Who cares? That's a logical argument. His problem is not logical. His problem is, he's just accepted a paradigm simply because the paradigm is a foreign idea. I was in an Islamic institution and I had, uh, you guys are mashallah very civilized, but I had a rowdy group of students who were not like, and I actually riled them up because when I was doing that, we were doing a four day course on atheism. So when I delivered the course and with the rest of the instructors, what we say is this, we say, when you see something you don't like, you challenge it, you question it, you interrupt us. That's the environment we created with these guys, okay? So these guys, we had a bit of a, a banter going on. So this is, I think, on the last day. So we were about to do some slides, and like usual, they ask questions, they challenge, and they question. So I said to them, and these are all young Muslim students, right? So I said to them, listen, guys, I'm going to end atheism in two slides. <laughs> and I'm going to end them in two slides and throughout this whole time, you know they were talking back to me? I said, and you are not even going to say a word. So I'm going to use these two slides and all of you guys, I guarantee you are not even going to say a word. They're like, yeah, yeah, let's bring it on. I said, okay, no problem. <laughs> I put on the first slide, I showed a picture of Richard Dawkins. I said, this is the father of new atheism today. I want you to have a thought experiment in your head. The thought experiment is, this guy who wrote The God Delusion, which somehow became a bestseller and took off as the, the genesis of the new atheist movement. I said, I just want you to imagine something. His name is not Richard Dawkins. His name is Rahul Devinder. He is from the University of Calcutta. He has a heavy Indian accent. He has written The God Delusion. It's the same content which you have today. The same content. And he's also a professor at university. So that's the first thing. Second thing, I showed them the map of the world, where all the wealth is. The wealth in the world is in Western Europe. You have poverty in Africa. I said, okay, Europeans who are rich, they believe in God. Africans who are poor, they're all atheists. I said, that's the end of new atheism. And they were all quiet. That's all it is. When I've had long, long, long debates, fundamentally, it comes down to they're white people, they know what they're doing, and they're rich. I'm being honest with you. If you take those two things into account, you get rid of the race issue, you get rid of the wealth issue. Do you think some African philosopher sitting in a hut trying to explain to a Pakistani about the anthropic principle, planetary version, yeah? Do you think he's going to take him seriously? These are social movements. And this is why, and you can watch the debates, um, Muhammad Hijab, Hamza Sotsis, Hamza Maya and others. We have to teach people what atheism is and then refute it to the people who claim to be atheists. Because they don't become atheists for logical reasons. It's just a social fact. Yes. 